for a sprinter, a good start can be the difference between achieving everlasting glory and being forgotten forever. It's no wonder, then, that so much of a sprinter's training is geared towards getting out of the blocks as quickly as possible. In the 1988 Olympic Games, the decathlon field was historically strong. Defending champion Daley Thompson was back, and a pair of young East Germans, Christian Schenk and Torsten Voss, were looking to make their mark on the grandest stage. One man who was desperate to make a big impression was West Germany's Jürgen Hinkson. He was the world record holder, but had only managed silver in 1984. He was 30 in 1988, in his prime, and ready to claim the gold that had slipped past him in Los Angeles. The first event was the 100 meters, not Hinkson's favorite discipline. He would need an excellent start. He was clearly keen. It was Hinkson again. Decathletes are allowed two false starts, so he was still in contention. As long as he didn't... No. Oh. Despite protesting his innocence, Hinkson's campaign was over before it had begun. His Olympic career had ended with a whimper. He would never return to the Games. But Hinkson wasn't a full-time sprinter, so his over-eager starting can be forgiven. Specialist sprinters spend years perfecting their starts, precisely to avoid situations like the one Hinkson found himself in. Linford Christie arrived in Atlanta as defending champion of the 100 meters. His gold medal in Barcelona had come at the relatively old age of 32, so at 36, Atlanta was certain to be his final Olympic Games. Christie had defied his years to cruise to the final, winning his second round heat ahead of the world champion, Canada's Donovan Bailey. The lineup for the final was formidable. Alongside Bailey, there was world number one Frankie Fredericks, who had finished behind Christie in 1992 to claim the silver. The USA's Dennis Mitchell, who earned bronze in the same race. Atto Bolden, the superstar in waiting, who'd become the youngest 100-meter medalist in world championship history the previous year. And Mike Marsh, who had won gold in the 200 meters in Barcelona. It was a high caliber field. There would be no room for mistakes. Christie knew he'd need to run the perfect race to retain his title. A rare false start from Christie. Famously an excellent starter, he knew he'd have to be flawless today. He pushed his luck. One more of those and his Olympic Games career would be over. Another false start. This time, young Bolden was at fault. Tension was building. Third time lucky? Christie looked bemused, but replays seemed to confirm that he was at fault. His title defense was over in heartbreaking circumstances. Or was it? Christie removed the second flag from his blocks. He was refusing to accept the verdict. It was remarkable behavior from the elder statesman of sprinting. He was asked to leave the arena, and after holding up the race for nearly three minutes, he reluctantly stepped away from the track. He watched on helplessly as he lost his crown to Donovan Bailey. It was a bizarre end to the international career of one of the greatest sprinters in history. But at least Christie made it onto the track, which is more than can be said for some. Heading into the 1972 Olympic Games, Ray Robinson and Eddie Hart were two of the hottest prospects in sprinting. They were joint world record holders. Both were tipped to win medals in the 100 meters. After qualifying easily from their first round heats in the morning, the two young sprinters went back to the Olympic Village to relax. 
Their coach, Stan Wright, was looking after their schedule. He told them that their second round heats wouldn't start until six o'clock at the earliest. At 4.15, Robinson and Hart met in the athletes' village and turned the television on. They saw a men's 100 meters race. It was the second round. The pictures were live. Confusion set in, then panic. They hurried to the stadium, but it was too late. Hart and Robinson missed their race and were disqualified. Coach Stan Wright had been working from the wrong schedule. For both young sprinters, their life's work had unraveled in front of them. It was devastating. To make matters worse, the gold was eventually won by Valerie Bortsov of the USSR in a time of 10.14 seconds. Robinson and Hart had both run 9.95 seconds earlier that year. Neither Robinson nor Hart would ever win an Olympic medal in an individual event. Their golden, once-in-a-lifetime chance had been blown in gut-wrenching circumstances. So next time you sleep through your alarm clock and you get that sickening feeling in the pit of your stomach, try to imagine how Ray Robinson and Eddie Hart felt when they turned on that television.